that's just enough. Good morning and welcome to Show Creek Baptist Church on this beautiful Sunday, August the 15th, 2021. If you can, come on in and take a seat. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning with our worship service. As always, we like to kick off the worship service with some church announcements to make sure that you are in the loop and you are uh, in the circle of information of all the wonderful things going on here at Show Creek Baptist Church. Everything can be found in your bulletin. Everything can be found at Show Creek Baptist Church. Dot org. But there are a few things we'd like to go over with you this morning. Before we do that, though, we'd like to recognize all of our guests and visitors who are visiting with us for the first time this morning. We say a special welcome to you and to your family. We have a Connect card for you. It's located in the pew back in front of you. If you'll take that card out, fill it out. And when you leave the sanctuary this morning after this morning's service, you'll find three offering boxes on the back wall. Just drop it in one of those offering boxes We'll have a record of your visit, and we'll be in touch sometime this week, either through email, text message, or phone call, to follow up with your visit to see if you have any questions about our church or church family, or if there's a way we can minister to you and to your family. But some church announcements to go over with you this morning to make sure that you are in the loop. Awana kicks off a new year this Wednesday, August the 18th at 6 p.m., if your child is interested in participating, we ask that you will register your child so we can be prepared and ready for a wonderful year. You can register your child today at showcreepbaptist.org, or you can call the church office tomorrow or see Miss Shannon after today's service. It's going to be a wonderful year with Awana, and we're praying for all the uh, wonderful discipleship that will take place and that awesome ministry that we're so blessed to have here at Show Creek Baptist Church. On top of that, Wednesday night dinners will resume this Wednesday, August the 18th at 5.15. More information can be found in your bulletin, including this week's menu. If you would like more information on Show Creek, we invite you to the next Discover Show Creek class, which will be next Sunday, August the 22nd, following the morning service. Lunch will be provided. If you plan to attend, please RSVP by August the 18th, this coming Wednesday, by calling the church office. More information can be found in your bulletin, and we hope that you plan to attend that class for more information here on Show Creek Baptist Church. Mark your calendars because our next Family Sunday will be August the 29th. There will be no child care during the worship service. We'll worship together as one big family, and it's going to be a wonderful Sunday. Mark your calendars now. Every Sunday night in October at 6 p.m. for Fall Revival. It's going to be a wonderful time. Your bulletin will list all the speakers that we have scheduled to be with us. Reaching our community will be our theme, will be our, our purpose and our focus this year with Fall Revival. And we want it to be on your calendar starting today so that you can make plans to be here. There's a lot more going on here at Show Creek Baptist Church. See today's bulletin or showcreekbaptist.org. Let's all stand this morning. I'll try to keep it short for Ram because I know last week he said it ran over a little bit too long. So, Ram, why don't you kick off the service this morning for us? Good morning. Y'all ready to worship this morning? It's a pretty day. I'm happy to be here. Hope y'all done filled up with coffee and you're ready to go. One, two, three, four. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Amazing grace. 
thankful you can sing about all the things you've done for us and that he is a faithful God. Uh, one of the best ways to fulfill or to, to talk back and bring back is to tell others about how he's been faithful to you. So a little plug right now. If you recall, if you've been here at Shoal Creek for any length of time, a long time ago we did a little thing we did uh, called cardboard testimonies. So we're going to start planning that again. If you don't know what they are, it's an awesome and easy way for you to share your testimony. So what you'll do is you'll have a big piece of cardboard on one side, something about your past, and then you'll flip it over and it'll say something about your present. So it can be as simple as lost, found. It can be cancer, survivor. It can be lost job, employed. Just what has God done in your life? So if you'd be interested in a uh, being a part of that, come find me after the service, and uh, we're going to start planning that out. But for right now, we're going to sing about his faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow.
sing that song and think about Lamentations 3 22 and 23 it says you know God's love and kindness never never ends compassions that fail not they're brand new every morning I can't imagine that you know a brand new every morning his love for us compassion and kindness is brand new great is thy faithfulness you know think about how unfaithful we are in our lives you know we don't, we're always unfaithful to God think about Luke 5 with Peter you know, it was in the boat, and Jesus told him to cast his net in the deep parts. Lord, we toiled all night. We caught nothing. Jesus didn't say, well, what bait did you use? Or what was the water temperature? Or what was the tide of that, that night? He didn't say that. He says, cast into the deep. We know that Jesus is sovereign over the fish. Because a few, few days later, he told, you know, he told Peter, he said, go out there and get that catch me. The first fish you catch, get that coin out of his mouth. What? Ain't no way. No way. You can do it. But he did. We're, un we're unfaithful to God. We, I, but I thank God he is faithful to us. And all we, you know, every time we count on him, we can rely upon him. We can trust him because he's always faithful. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. It is well, it is well. 
about what's going on in the world. The world is looking for something that can cure their emptiness. But God's already done that when he shed his blood on that cross. You know, it can be well with our soul, but are we sharing that with others? You know, that's what the church is all about. We come here on Sunday and Wednesday to, to worship, to get recharged, to to get a vision of what God has for us in this church. But what are you doing on Tuesday and Monday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday to help those around you that are looking to have their souls filled? Because everybody's looking for something to fill that emptiness that only Jesus can fill. And if we aren't sharing that with the world, then what are we doing for Christ? You know, it takes people not being selfish. It takes people living by faith. And I challenge you guys this week to ask God to allow you to share the gospel with somebody. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you're going to do. Well, we thank you for this church. And we thank you for Brother Malin and the message that you've laid on his heart to preach. Lord, I pray that today we would just bring glory and honor to you in all that we do. Allow our hearts to be filled, Lord, as it already has through this singing. We pray these things in your name. Amen. And I am surrounded on every side. Can't see the light of day. But I am persuaded beyond all hope. You won't let go of me. I stake my claim on every word you say. You will not be late. And I will sing through fire. darkest of weather no I can see I still believe you're good so I'm moving forward through crashing waves I know I'm safe with you you hold my life you hear my cry with every breath Inside. I will sing through fire and thunder, cause you are on my side. I trust you with my life. I know my story it isn't over, even against all odds. Oh, you are a faithful God. That's who Trust you with my life. I know my story. 
Show Creek. It's good to see everyone here this morning. As you already see up there on the PowerPoint, we are starting a new book, a new study. Amen. It is something I'm gonna get y'all awake here soon. That's all right. We'll get into it. It is a new series, and it is a series that I am really, really looking forward to. And so it's in the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth is in the Old Testament. It is right after the book of Judges and right before the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, it's only going to probably be a couple pages long in your Bibles. And so if you'll go on and start making your way there to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. We're going to be in chapter 1 this morning, and we're only going to take on the first seven verses this morning. That's all we're going to take into it, because we've got to get the context and everything else to really understand and to bring to light what happens in this wonderful story of redemption. And so we're in the book of Ruth. I hope you've made your way there. However, you got a copy of God's Word, either by phone or tablet. Um, but however you got a, or in book form, and so however you got a copy, Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and I'm going to ask that if you have the ability to, to simply stand out of reverence for the reading of God's holy and perfect word this morning in expectation of what Christ can and will do through the hearing of his word, knowing it never returns void, and that faith comes by hearing, and the hearing of the word of Christ. Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Now the name of this man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malan and Chilion, Ephrites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one is Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malan and Chilion also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard at the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and was giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Let's pray. Father, Thank you so much for giving us simply an opportunity to come here this morning and to open our words, uh, or your word up together and to begin to study. Father, I, I thank you for guiding us to this book. I thank you for allowing us to be able to study it together. I just simply ask for you to do what only you can do, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll speak to us through the reading and the teaching of your word, and that you will give us the boldness and the desire and the hunger and the thirst to simply apply it to our lives, that we truly will be the very light and the salt that you've commanded us to be. Father, I thank you for those that have taken time out of their day, out of their busy schedules, to simply come and to lift your name up in song and in prayer and to study your word together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
Of course, the message this morning I've titled God in the Midst of Tragedy because, you know, usually when we read a story like of Ruth and when, if you were to go out into the city here in Priceville or in Decatur or the surrounding areas and you were to talk about Ruth, everybody is just going to talk about the love story. But Ruth does not take place in a love story. It takes place in the midst of a tragedy. It's a tragic thing, and so I want you to focus in on that this morning as we begin to study. As you saw as we read these verses, it's, it's really just a whole bunch of context. There's nothing really going on. It's just giving you names and places and a little bit of news about what's happening in their life. It's setting the story up. But in the setup of this story, you're going to see this. God is moving. God is moving. And the reason why I wanted to take time to tell you this is because sometimes when we're in the middle of the tragedy, when times are bad, we don't see him moving. We wonder where he is. Just as you read that verse or those first seven verses, how many of you saw that God was moving? It doesn't come off that way comes off as one person's died, this person's died, this person died, there's a famine going on. It doesn't look like God's doing something, but you hear me clearly. That's why I love the set this morning from our worship team. God is faithful, even in the midst of a tragedy, even when things seem to be going wrong. But Ruth, for most people, is like a fairy tale. You know, it's one of those great stories, and y'all know me, when I, I, I start a message, I always like to give a little bit of an illustration. There's great lines in the book of Ruth. Ruth uh, has stories, and most of us can tell those stories, just like when we watch movies, many of us can quote movies, all right? We've watched them enough, we know. There's tons of movies out there that I always sort of refer to as classics, there is one classic movie that is never allowed to be played in my house. Never allowed to be played in my house. Do you understand that? Do not give this movie to me as a gift. It will be thrown away. But it's a great movie. It will just never be shown again. And that is The Notebook. <laughs> I will never watch that movie. I've watched it one time. It will never happen again. Great movie, but heck no. <laughs> I'm not even giving you a line from that movie. Like, I'm tearing up thinking about it. Turn, man. <laughs> we'll move on to other great classics. Dirty Dancing. You know, my daughter had never seen that movie. And so I was like, you know, I cannot be a good father and not allow you to see Dirty Dancing. It's a classic. Well, then I watched it, and it's like, I don't know if I'm a good father or not for allowing you to watch this movie. <laughs> God, it's how you're, the way you see things just change over time. You're just like, man, that was an awesome movie. Oh, whoa, whoa, hey. <laughs> God. But there's lines in it like this. Nobody puts baby in a corner. That's awesome. It's a line that's just there, and I, I think about it, and I, I use it a lot. And I, I'll say it to get uh, a laugh out of my wife or some friends. There's, there's other movies that have great one lines that everybody knows, like Jerry Maguire. And I'm not talking about Show Me the Money. It's not what I'm talking about. It's the one where they're at the getting after all the mess ups in his life and things have been sort of going bad and things are starting to make a turnaround in his life that he comes up to his wife and in it, that sad moment where he says, you complete me. And I just love her response. She just says, shut up. <laughs> you had me a Hello. Ah, it's good. It's a good one line. Of course, there's movies like A Few Good Men that is just filled with one-liners. You can't handle the truth. It's probably one of the best roles of Jack Nicholson in his life, even though he's had tons of them. It's just a great movie because there you have Hanks or Tom Cruise asking, I want the truth, and he says you can't handle it. And then, of course, I have to end with a sports movie. 
Hoosiers. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I love that movie. It's one of those that when it comes on, I don't turn it off. I've seen it a thousand times, and I'll just keep watching it. And one of my favorite parts is where the coach is about to be ran out of town, and they call a town meeting, and they're, they're going to vote him out. They're going to have just have somebody volunteer to coach, and they're going to toss the season up as a loss. And here comes the all-star player. Everybody wanted him to play. He's this great, wonderful basketball player, and he walks in and says, I'm going to play. And, of course, the whole town erupts in cheer because they assume because the bad coach is leaving. But then he says, but I won't play if he don't coach. And then they're stuck. What are they going to do? They got, I had the star player, and he stood up for the coach. It's just one of those heartwarming things. Fairy tales are this way. Y'all can think of tons of fairy tales, and you know all the lines. You know all the parts of it. You've heard it time and time again. And many of us think of Ruth this way. It's a fairy tale. It's, it's a wonderful love story. And the reason why we think of it that way, and we think of it as a fairy tale, because there are a lot of similarities to these fairy tale stories, to these heartwarming stories, these classic movies. There's a lot of similarities. Like most fairy tales, how do they always begin? Anybody want to take a wild guess? Once upon a time. That's how you assume a fairy tale will start. Well, how does the book of Ruth start? She's, it says, now came about in the days of the judge's governor. That's similar. It's close. And in this fairy tale, what do you find? You find a bitter, broken down mother in law. You find a desperate situation. You find tragedy. You find romance. You find a climactic moment. Is Boaz going to be able to redeem Ruth or not be able to redeem Ruth? Is it going to be the other man that ends up getting Ruth? And we're all sitting there on pins and needles, and then all of a sudden, Boaz is the one. I hate to ruin the story for you if you've never read Ruth. But Boaz ends up getting the girl, and everybody does what? Oh, it's great. That's it. And it's happily ever after. And so we, we liken Ruth to a fairy tale, but y'all, there's nothing further from the truth on that. This is also a type of story that could truly come out of modern-day Hollywood. It's extremely relevant. It's extremely contemporary. I mean, I, I sometimes wonder why Hollywood hadn't already redone this movie multiple times, especially now in our current culture. Because in this book, you're going to find immigrants. You're going to find immigrants struggling. Then you're going to find a male-dominated society. And in the midst of this male-dominated society, you're going to find a heroine. She is going to be a hard-working woman, a champion among women. And she's going to rise up in power and authority, and it's a great heartwarming story. And so I'm sort of surprised that we hadn't seen it yet. But here's the truth when it comes to the story of Ruth. Ruth is no fairy tale. It's just simply not. This is not a make-believe story. This is a historical fact. There is a reason why it is in the Bible. And it's not in the Bible because God just wants you to have a good love story to read. It's not there to make you have this wonderful, feel-good story about it. No, it is simply to remind you that God is faithful at all times. And even in the darkest of moments, He is working through. But it's also going to tell you how some of the key characters come about in the history of Scripture. Are you aware that Ruth, is the great-grandmother of King David. King David's name is mentioned more in the Bible than anybody's name, including Jesus. And his great-grandmother is Ruth. And so we start to understand how this great character of King David comes about because of her. And, of course, David is in the lineage of Christ. And you see Ruth mentioned specifically in the lineage of Jesus Christ. She's in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So do not read this story and do not start this study of the book of Ruth thinking, what a wonderful fairy tale. Because it's not. It's not a fairy tale. This is a historical fact. This is what happened. 
This is how David comes about, who is eventually going to be one of the greatest kings of Israel's history, and both will be in the lineage of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so the first thing we have to do is we've got to get the historical context. We've got to understand the background. There's no way to understand the Bible if you do not understand the context. You have to have the context. The context is king of everything. Luckily for us is that it tells us everything we need to know right here in our passage. See, a lot of us think when we think of the story of Ruth and we start picturing in our head what does this look like, we picture Bethlehem. And how do you always picture Bethlehem? Nice rural country village. It's like Mayberry, y'all. What a better place for a love story. You know, this is no different than Lifetime movies or what's the other one? Hallmark. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, oh, and so it's, it's just that scene. It's just set up and it's going to play out that way. But nothing could be further from the truth. Bethlehem was not Mayberry. It was not a nice and wonderful place and a happy little place. That's not the case at all. This happens in one of the darkest moments in all of Israel's history. But most of us miss it when we read chapter 1 and we just begin starting it. Look at verse 1. Verse 1 tells you basically everything. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Verse 1 sets up the context perfectly. The problem is, is you've got to have some Bible knowledge to know what they're talking about. You've got to know who these people are, where these locations are, and what time period it's happening. But it tells you all of it, everything you need to know, in verse 1. Verse 1, the first thing it says, in the days when the judges governed. Now, when we think of judges, we're thinking of mighty Samson. We're thinking of Gideon. We're thinking of all these great judges mentioned in our Bible. But you need to understand, the time of judges was horrible. It truly is the darkest moment in Israel's history. What you'll see, and, I, and I'll give you a brief synopsis real quick of judges... God's people are now in the promised land. Joshua has led them in. They've divided up the, the promised land into the 12 tribes of Israel, and each one of them is governing their own little sections. And God says, all right, now I've got a set of rules. Don't, don't be intermediate marrying with everybody and taking their gods. Just you stay faithful to me, and I'm going to be faithful to you. That's basically what he says in a nutshell. And what did the people do? They were not faithful. They began to fall away. And in the book of Judges, you'll see a phrase repeated at the end of almost every chapter. They did what was right in their own eyes. They did what was right in their own eyes. What they thought was good. And every time they do what was right in their own eyes, they'd fall and they'd mess up. And God would have to bring a famine. He would bring enemies. He would allow dark things to happen to the people so that they would be brokenhearted enough to repent and come back to him. Now, a lot of people want to get upset about that. They say, oh, no, a loving God would never do such a thing. That's hogwash. How many of you, when you look at your children, and you, you tell your children, do your homework? And when they don't do their homework, and instead they're watching YouTube on a tablet or something that you walk in and you praise them and congratulate them on not doing their homework. Does anybody do that? Good, I was worried for a minute. I'm afraid some of you might actually do that. The truth is you don't. What do you do? You take the tablet away. You take whatever's drawing their attention away from the task that they're supposed to be doing that's going to help them grow and mature and be used in their life. God does the same thing. He disciplines his children the same way we do ours, except a whole lot better than we do. And so God says, all right, you're not going to do what I've told you to do. You're not going to grow and prosper the way that you could be growing and prospering. I'm going to make it so difficult for you to continue in your sin that eventually you will stop and you will repent and you will come back to me. 
That is what he's telling them. Y'all, when it comes to the specific time frame, we don't really know. Most people assume that this happens during the time of Gideon, the judge Gideon. And the reason why they believe it happens during the time of the judge Gideon is because it's the only place in Scripture that is mentioned in the book of Judges where famine might actually be happening. Nowhere in all the book of Judges does it use the word famine. But during the time of Gideon, what is Gideon doing when Gideon comes on the scene? Does anybody remember? When the first time we ever meet Gideon in the Bible. He's in a wine press threshing wheat. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. But he's doing it because he's scared to death that his enemy's going to take his food because everybody's starving. There's nothing to eat. And so a lot of scholars believe it happens during the time of Gideon. Plus, scholars are smart enough to start doing what an average age person is, and they just take it back until about the time of Gideon. But during the time of Gideon, you had the Midianites and the Amalekites all attacking at the same time. But what I really want to do to set up the context to help you understand the city, this location that the story of Ruth is going to happen, there's a couple stories at the end of Judges that are just terrible. And if you've never read the book of Judges, I suggest don't start at the end of Judges because it is some of the worst stories you'll ever read. They're dark and humiliating. It, it's a terrible thing. One of the things that happens is you have a Levite who is a, one of the priests, and he has a mistress, and the mistress lives in Bethlehem. And she runs away from the priest, and he goes and he catches her in her hometown of Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is where Ruth's story takes place. And as they leave Bethlehem, they go to the land of Benjamin. And if you know anything about it, Benjamin's right next to the land of Judah, so it's really just like a day's walk from Bethlehem. And there, in that side Benjamin, what happens is a bunch of men rise up, and apparently they like the mistress, and... They're going to take her by force. And they do. The whole city ravaged this poor little girl. And then the Levite priest that had captured her or, and came back and took her, he was so upset on what happened is that he just sort of divides her body up into pieces and has her mailed out across the land of Israel to show all of Israel what Benjamin had done. And a civil war broke out. And all of this is in the backyard of our story. All of that's happening. So don't ever read the book of Ruth and think, Mayberry. You need to be thinking of some of the worst places there ever was. Some of the darkest moments there ever was. That's where this story happened. And so when you read this story, it changes everything about this story when you truly understand the history that is going on behind the scenes. Because here's the deal. See, we, we think of these stories and we think of all the fairy tales. The, the reality is it, it's sort of like Brett and Scarlet and Gone with the Wind. I was going to use that movie as one of the classic movies, but the problem is the main line that most people remember from that movie is not appropriate to come from the pulpit. There's a horrible war going on. Rape, murder, tragedy. That's the story in the setting of Ruth. That's what's going on. And so it's not just what you read here that you see a father die and his sons die and you see a famine going on. You've got to understand the whole country is in utter turmoil. Everything is bad. And that's when you start to see God working. He is doing something. Y'all, that's one of the things I love about the story of Ruth is that it becomes absolutely clear how God works even in the darkest moments of our lives. And that's why I'm excited about this study going through Ruth because in the darkest moments of our life, we see God shining more than ever. We see His faithfulness more than ever. And so the first thing I want to bring to you point-wise out of this study or this first section of chapter 1 is this. The grass is not always greener on the other side. Now hear me close and hear me clear. The grass is not always greener on the other side. That's 
the thing that you're going to need to take away First off, right here in the text, the grass is not always going to be greener on the other side. So let's go, jump in and see exactly what I'm trying to talk about here and why I'm bringing this point out to you. Again, verse 1, it says, Now it came about in the days when the judges governed, there was a famine in the land. A certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. And so we see right away that what? There's a famine going on. And so you have a man with a wife and two sons, and there's no food, which is sort of ironic when you understand the name of Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread, all right? Names in the Bible mean something, and we'll get more into that as we go through this study. But Bethlehem means house of bread, and so it was known as the bread basket, just like we have the bread basket here in the United States. Bethlehem was the bread basket of Israel, and if they're starving in the bread basket of Israel, guess what the rest of the country's doing? Starving. This would be the last place that a famine would hit, and yet that is exactly where the famine has taken place. And so you have a man living in the house of bread, and now all of a sudden there is no food. Something else that you've got to see is that he's going to end up wanting to leave the promised land. He, he's going to end up wanting to walk away. He's willing to leave and to go to the land of Moab. Now, Moab is an interesting place. I put the map up there so you can know what's going on. Bethlehem is not on this map, but it's just a little bit south of Hebron right there where it says Kingdom of Judah. And so below heaven right there is where Bethlehem would be. And he's going to go over here to this purple area, the kingdom of Moab. He's got to get around the Dead Sea. He most likely would have went through the Jericho area. So it's not a small walk that he's about to make. He is about to take his wife and two kids in the middle of a famine on this journey going to the kingdom of Moab. The problem is Moab is not a part of God's people. It wasn't one of the 12 tribes. He is leaving the promised land. Moab means something. To understand the land of Moab, you've got to know where Moab came from, and that's back in Genesis. In Genesis, there was a man by the name of Lot. And Lot lived in a town called Sodom. And he had two daughters. And when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his two daughters ended up going up to a cave and living in a cave. They thought the world was coming to an end, and so there they lived in that little cave there. And then the daughter ends up getting her father drunk, having relations with him, and the product is Moab. They actually named the son Moab. Now, all names mean something in Scripture. If Esau, Esau means hairy. And, of course, it says when Esau was born, he was covered in red hair. Jacob was holding the heel of Esau when he was born. They were twins. And so they called him heel grasper or supplanter, which is what Jacob means. When it comes to Moab, do you all know what Moab means? From the father. Well, that's literal. And so when they ask you, who's your baby daddy? He says, well, the daddy's the baby daddy. That's what it is. Moab means from the father because it comes from an ancestral relationship. These are basically, and understand, Lot and Abraham were cousins. And so this land of Moab is the hillbilly country cousins to the Jews. All right? Y'all following me? Because they're all from the daddy. That's Moab, and that's where he's going. That's where he is taking his wife and his two kids to the hillbilly cousins of my daddy is the baby daddy. That's where they're going. Something else, God has, is not really fond of Moab. Moab, the people, took after their parents, and y'all, they, they just did not follow God. They had many idols that they worshipped, and he didn't have much for them. And don't take my word for it. In Psalms 60, verse 8, this is what it says. Moab is my wash pot, and upon Edom I cast my shoe, and over Philistia I shout in triumph. You don't want to live in a place that God refers to as a wash pot. It's not a good thing. 
And that is exactly where Elimelech is going to take his family. He is going to leave the house of bread, and he's going to go to the land of the wash pot to his hillbilly cousins. My daddy is my baby daddy. That is where they are headed. Now we jump into verse 2 of our passage. The name of the man was Elimelech, and his name and wife was Naomi. And the names of the two sons were Malan and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and were remained there. That's where they're going to go. Again, all these names mean something. Elimelech means my God is king. That's a good name. How many of you named your kids Elimelech? It's a good name, right? Amen? Yeah. Naomi. That's a good name. You know what it means? Pleasant. Hallelujah, I'm wearing, marrying a pleasant wife. <laughs> so Elimelech's got a good. He's got God is my king, and I've got a pleasant wife. That is what we see here. Now, those two names are awesome. It seems like a wonderful couple. Then it comes to their son. Their sons' names rhyme a little bit because their names mean similar things. One of their sons' names, the oldest, was Malan. I don't know if you know a Malan. <laughs> but I've met four Malans in my life, and I'm one of them, in case you're new. <laughs> this is where my name comes from. I have a biblical name, but most people don't know that I have a biblical name because it's only mentioned twice in all the Bible, chapter 1 of Ruth and the last chapter of 4 of Ruth. Only places you'll ever see Malan mentioned. Does anybody want to take a wild guess what my name means? Weak and sickly. <laughs> name your kids Elimelech. They're going to make fun of Malin or Elimelech anyway. At least have a good name. I ask my mom all the time. I was named after my grandfather who was Malin. It wasn't because she saw weak and sickly. But the first time I went to Bible college and I was taking a Hebrew class and the teacher's going through the roll and he comes to my name and he goes, huh. Is there Malin here? <laughs> yes, sir. He said, you know what your name means? Ah, I was named after my granddaddy. <laughs> it's weak and sickly. Oh, God. <laughs> I called my mama that night. You know, my mama's like, you don't ever call me. Oh, I'm calling you tonight. <laughs> weak and sickly. Chilean means pining and wasting away. Pining and wasting away. So you got Malin and Chilion. Those are the two sons. And so you've got Elimelech and Naomi. My God is my king, pleasant. And they have two sons, and both of them are weak and sickly. Both of them are pining and wasting away. They're referred to here as the Pathrathites, which simply means this. They were of the upper echelon of Bethlehem. They're the founding family of Bethlehem. They're one of them. They're important people. That's what it's pointing to there, is that they're one of the important people of Bethlehem. That's going to come and become really important later on in this story. That this isn't just some odd family in Bethlehem. These are big wigs. This is people that people know because they're, they're some of the most important people in this area. But the picture is starting to be painted for us. We're starting to understand why, Mo, uh, why Elimelech does what he does, right? He's got a wife, and he's got two sons. And both of the sons ain't in that great a shape. Both of them are pretty weak. Both of them are a little sickly. And there's a massive famine going on, and you're in the midst of an area where there's rape, there's all kinds of brutal war going on. This is not a good place. And so he looks at the land of Washpot, Moab, and says, that grass is greener. I'm taking my family there. And on the onset of reading this story, y'all, this seems to be like a rational decision. 
If you're going to be taking care of these two sickly kids and you've got a wife, there's no food, what are you going to do? You go to Moab. And the reason why is, again, if you know the story of Israel, as they're coming into the land, they had to come all the way around and then crossing the Jordan, coming in on the backside. So it took them through the land of Moab, and Moab did not want them coming through. And so there's a lot of fighting and, and bad things happen during that story as they're trying to get in. And so they're not friendly to each other at all. Not at all. But the land there was so good that two of the tribes of Israel didn't even want to cross the Jordan. So the grass truly looked greener. It looked like a good place. Here we are in the house of bread and there's a famine. So let's just go over to the land of Moab. Here's the deal. We see it as greener grass, but that don't mean it's greener grass. Y'all do realize God's ways are not our ways and our th his thoughts are not our thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 is where I get that, where it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord's. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, this isn't the first time we see this. God called a man by the name of Abraham. He's what we many refer to as the father of our faith. And he takes him to the promised land. And as soon as he gets to the promised land, if you'll remember, a famine took over. And what did he do? He hightailed it to Egypt, where it was better, right? No. There in Egypt, he almost lost his wife, and he also pins up, picks up a handmaiden for his wife by the name of Hagar. Later on, his wife is going to tell him to have an, uh, relations with his handmaiden, to have offspring, and that's Ishmael. And the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac, the other son of Abraham, are still killing each other today in the Middle East. It looked good to Abraham. But what should Abraham have done? He should have stayed in the promised land. If God took you there, he's going to keep you. He's going to protect you. He's going to watch over you. And why did God bring famines into the land of Israel? Why did God allow the enemies to come and to take all their food? Because he wants them to turn back to him. He wants them to repent. But what do we do as humans? We're going to find an easier way. We're going to look for the greener grass. The heck with repenting and actually acknowledging my problems and where I am in relations to him currently in my spiritual walk. I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to fix the problem. I'm going to Moab. So that's what Elimelech does. He packs up his kids and his wife, and they head off to Moab. One bad decision is going to lead to another bad decision. You need to be able to see this. Verses 3 and 4, Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons, and they took themselves Moabite women as wives, the name of one Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there for about 10 years. There was two things that God had already said they needed to do. They needed to be in the land of promise. It's the land God had given them. But Elimelech left that. Something else God told them not to do is not to take wives from other tribes. Because if you take wives from other tribes, you're going to be tempted to follow their gods. And so when Elimelech dies, what does Naomi do? She has Malan and Chilion marry Moabite women which was forbidden by God. But see, here's the deal. We're really good about seeing God's law and then trying to justify why it doesn't apply to us. Not at this time. But there's always consequences to these things. That's what you see here. There's going to be one consequence after another, one bad decision after another when they get there. Because the whole point is they were supposed to only be there for a little bit. They were only going to be there for a little bit. Notice that what it said there earlier is that they were going to sojourn. They were, they were going to be there, and they were going to sojourn for a little bit. And it also says he was going to stay in the country. He learned from the mistake of Lot. When Lot moved over there outside of Sodom, he ended up in the city. He was going to stay in the country, and he was going to sojourn, meaning he was going to be there temporary. But this temporary stay turned into 10 years. Ten years, three graves, three widows, and no children. 
Verse 5 tells us that they were not blessed in these things. Then both Malan and Chilion also died, and the women are bereft of their two children and her husband. There's no children. And so now you have the worst case scenario set up in our text. You have three widows in a land where widows had nothing. And they're in the midst of a famine, and they're in a foreign country, and it's not a good situation. That's what you see here in our story. Every one of these decisions has consequences. And what you need to understand in our life is that our life still has consequences. God still holds us accountable. Do you, are you aware that when you make decisions in your life and for your family, you need to ask God what you're going to be doing? You need to seek his will for your life. I get this from James, the book of James, chapter 4, verses 13 and 17. I'm going to read it to you. James 4, 13 and 17, it says this. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or, this or that city and spend a year there or carry on business and make money. Why do you not even know? Wh why? Do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Elimelech in his mind was making a perfectly rational decision according to human logic. Go to Moab. Flee. Get a better situation for you and your family. But according to God's word constantly, we are to be looking to him. Seeking why he's doing what he's doing. There, Y'all, there's nothing wrong with going to another city to make a living. There's nothing wrong with that. But you better check to see if it's according to his will. If God doesn't want you to go to that city and he doesn't want you to be doing what you're going to be doing in that city, then you can't expect God to bless you no more than you can. your kids expect you to bless them when they deliberately disobey you. There are consequences to every situation. The Bible shows us, y'all, there's times in the Bible where good people suffer. We're talking about it right now in our Sunday school class, talking about Job. We're doing a study through there. Job was a righteous man. Sometimes God allows bad things to happen to good people. But you are also aware sometimes bad things happen to bad people. They're doing bad things. There are consequences. I don't just come up with this off my head. It's in Scripture, Galatians chapter 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows from the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Here we have a story. And the story is a man who thought he could make his situation a little bit better by fleeing God's promised land, going to the foreign country of Moab, a place where he was not supposed to be, he ends up, he's only going to stay for a little bit, but they end up being there 10 years, and then he dies, his two sons dies. They also broke the law of God by marrying Moabites. There are consequences. And that's what you see when it comes to Elimelech and his family, consequences from it. The grass that appeared to be greener on the other side truly was seeking sand. They got stuck. Have you ever been there? I have. I've made one bad decision after another bad decision after another bad decision to where a point I thought I was stuck, like in sinking sand, quicksand. And the more I fight to get out, the harder it is to get out. Y'all, that's the situation they're in. That's what I want you picturing as this story, this study begins in Ruth. That's where they're at. It is one tragic thing after another, and they don't feel there's any way out. There is no hope. But that's why I love this story, because of the second point that you can take away, which will be our last point as well. God is always faithful. 
even in the midst of this, God is always faithful, even though they're messing it up constantly. Do you understand that God is always going to be faithful to the promises he's given you? Even when all light of all these bad decisions that they're making constantly, God is still at work and he is still upholding his part of the deal. He made a promise. He made a promise to Abraham that he was going to keep the covenant with him. Do y'all remember the story of the covenant of Abraham? It's a huge one because that's why God is going to be faithful to these people. Because if you're like me and I read this story and I read through Judges, all the horrible things that the God's people were doing in Judges, all the horrible mistakes that Elimelech, who said he was, his God is his king, but he ain't living like God is his king, and you see one mistake after another, and you ask, why in the world would God put up with these people? Why would he do it? Because he's a God of faith. He's a faithful God. He's a God that is just, and he's going to uphold his promises. In Genesis chapter 15, 12 through 21, we see the covenant of Abraham, which is still on all of us. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and a great darkness fell upon him. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch, and it passed between two pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. It's the covenant of Abraham. And if you don't know anything about Old Testament covenants, what they would do is they'd take animals and they'd cut the animals in two. And they would draw the two animals, the two halves of the animals apart. And you'd have all these severed animals right here. And of course, the blood, the entails, all, all the nasty stuff. Right here in the middle, as they've separated these two pieces of these animals. And what you would do if you made a covenant with someone, you would divide the animals, spread them out, you'd take them by their hand, and you would walk through the entrails, through all the blood and the muck together. And that's the, the sign is this. If one of them breaks that covenant, they're going to be that animal. That's what the picture is. If one of us break this, it's a blood oath, that if I fail you, you are allowed to do this to me. That's the symbol of it. Who walked through Abraham's covenant? There you just see it. Abraham's asleep, y'all, and he's watching it. The one that walks through it is two pieces, it's two lights together, and it is the Father and the Son as they walk through that together. It is the blood of Christ that sets us. It's Him who allows us to be able to uphold that covenant. Y'all, God has been faithful to us from the beginning. The reason why God doesn't turn His back on, judge, on Israel in the time of Judges is that most horrific thing. See, y'all, why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? I don't even have to tell you because you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the same thing happened in Israel. At the end of Judges, God's people did the same thing that he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for. And he didn't destroy them. Why? Because it's his covenant. And he's going to uphold the covenant. And the only righteous people in this world are the people that he has made righteous. It's through the blood of Christ and Christ alone. He's the one that upholds it. And so here we see all these horrible things happening, but yet God is being faithful all through it because we serve a faithful God. Even in the darkest of moments, he's still working. And some of you are thinking right now, no, no. Show me where he's working. I'll be happy to show you. Ruth chapter 1 and 20 and 21. We'll get to it next week, Lord willing. But I want you to see that she, of course, understands how bad God has afflicted them. She understands this. In Ruth 1, 20 and 21, Naomi said, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mar, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. And I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? She believes that God hates her what do you do when something bad happens to you 
When something bad happens, when you end up losing a loved one, or you get a diagnosis that you've got cancer, or when you're sitting there and you lose your job, or COVID is running rampant through the country, what do you do in the midst of that? Do you just automatically sit back and say, woe is me? God hates me? Hogwash. He loved you so much he gave up the thrones of heaven to come down and rescue you. You're allowing your current circumstances and thinking there's greener grass over there that something better could be happening to you. Y'all, that is garbage thinking. Naomi thought, she, look, she says, I left full. You didn't leave full. You were starving in Bethlehem. Why did you go to Washpot to the hillbilly cousins if you were so wonderful? Isn't it great to always look back on our life and think about how great things was? No, it weren't. You were miserable then, and you're miserable now. The truth is, is that we find our hope, our love, our joy, everything in Christ. And he is working in this story. Why? Because where are they wanting to go, y'all? They want to go back. Because God has shown favor again. See, he has the same pattern. If you would simply recognize your sin and repent, what does he do? Scripture says he's faithful and just to forgive us and wash us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we would just simply repent and not try to reason in our own way how I can get out of this. No, go back to him. Romans 8.28 is true. And we know now that all things work together for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Man, have I ever seen that verse printed somewhere. People post it all the time. We know that all things, y'all know what all things means? All things. That's good and bad stuff. If you believe God's blessing you in the good times, he's still blessing you in the bad times too. I serve a God that works in the midst of tragedy. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He is not going to abandon me. Not in the darkest of hours. That's when he's doing some of his greatest of work. So in all things, and it's for those that what? Who love God and are actually seeking to do his will. Called according to his purpose. Do not sit there and be outright disobeying God and then also not seeking his will in anything and assume that God's just going to bless you and your socks off. That is not how it is. He's going to make you so stinking miserable he can get you back to the place where he will bless your socks off. That's the point. He's always doing good, and he does it here too. Ruth 1.6 in our passage, it says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that they might return to the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab the Lord had visited his people and is giving them food. So Elimelech takes his Two sickly kids and his wife, they leave. They go to the hillbilly cousins. They're there, and they take Moabite wives. God kills the Limelech, and he allows Malan and Chilean to die as well. And in the midst of the 10 years, all this time in Moab, God finally shines back on Israel. The land of the house of bread of Bethlehem has bread again because God is faithful. And what he's going to do is he's going to draw Naomi and these two Moabites back. But of course, there's more to this story than this. This is just a setup, y'all. This is just a context. And if you can't tell by now I'm excited about this story, there ain't nothing I can do for you. I love the story of Ruth because you have the darkest moment in Israel's history. You have a dark, horrible moment in the life of this family. The father and two sons are dead. Y'all, it looks hopeless. But God's working. And God's doing something. And even though they don't see it, God is truly working in the midst of this tragedy. And one of the sweetest and greatest love stories that was ever told happened in the darkest of moments. Some of you right now are in dark moments of your life and you're thinking there ain't no way out. You're in your sinking sand. I can promise you something. God's working. 
is simply on us to hit our knees and to figure out how and where and why he's working. Maybe you don't know Christ the way I know him. And if you don't, just simply put your faith in Christ. Y'all, in my life, I have lived some horrible moments. Y'all, most of you know my story. I was a raging alcoholic for years, and I've spent years of my life in rehab. And God not only restored my marriage, but he restored my life. And I've been serving him now faithfully as a pastor for over 10 plus years. And I love teaching him. And I love what God's doing in my life. But I wouldn't take back any of those dark moments, as miserable as they were, because it was in those dark moments that he showed me who I truly was and who he truly is. And what you're going to see in this story is that these dark, horrible moments Every one of them has a purpose. And I have a God that has a purpose for my life. And you have a God that has a purpose for your life. You might be in seeking sand right now. You may have been seeking greener grass in the land of Moab. Go back to the house of bread. Go back to Bethlehem. Get back to the promised land where he wants you. And seek Christ. Repent of the sins that are in your life. And let God start doing the work that he said he was going to do in your heart. Stop running and get back to him. Let's pray. Father.